Welcome to the third training video in the series Raw Development with Sigma Photo Pro. In this video I will describe with some examples editing and saving a color image based on an X3F RAW file. As was mentioned in the previous videos, when I develop an X3F RAW file in SPP it is not my intention to produce a finished image but rather the best possible results which can be used as a good starting point for a final optimization in a digital imaging software such as Adobe Photoshop. From this series of images of a poppy field there are several variations available from strongly overexposed to somewhat underexposed. I know from experience and of course because I checked the picture earlier that this slightly overexposed image will probably be the best starting point. In the large preview it is possible to see the areas of the JPEG that are completely burnt out. This is an example of the advantages I talked about in the first video of working with a RAW file as compared to an out of camera JPEG. This JPEG picture is simply not usable. As a RAW file however all the editing tools within SPP are available to get the best results from the photograph. When a RAW file is opened for the first time in SPP, it takes a few seconds, depending on the settings in the preferences, for either the last used SPP settings or the settings from the camera to be applied to the image. If you know in advance that these settings are not appropriate, then it is possible before this calculation is finished to reset the tone adjustments and color adjustment menus. In addition, the color mode can be set to standard, and, as a reasonable start point, the white balance set to daylight. Finally I check the chroma and luminance noise reduction sliders are set to the left. When the calculation is finished and the new image rendition is displayed, then I ask myself the first questions. How does the image look? What are the problems? And most importantly, where do I want to take the image? Having a clear concept here will be a great bonus as the picture is edited and optimized. In this particular example, I want a relatively light image without looking too overexposed. I also want the image to be less yellow, perhaps even to look as if a light cross process has been used. How does the histogram look? Is the image generally under or overexposed? Are there any areas that are burnt out showing the color warning mask? Here a small tip, when taking raw images it is much better to slightly, with the emphasis on slightly, overexpose the image. Since the human eye recognizes much more information in light areas of an image rather than dark areas, the apparent linear scale of the histogram is actually rather deceiving. This is a very complex subject and is well beyond the scope of this video. Nevertheless, it is worth bearing in mind that it is much better to darken a slightly overexposed image than to lighten an underexposed image, since much more information will have been captured in the lighter image. This is the reason why shadowed areas rapidly develop both chroma and luminous noise when they are lightened. Here then, first of all, two very important tonal adjustment sliders, exposure and fill light. If the exposure slide is moved to the left, then the image is darkened slightly. As ever, please wait for the changes to be applied to the image. So that the shadow areas do not become too dark, it is possible to compensate by moving the fill light slider to the right. Take care. If the exposure or the fill light are moved more than, say, plus 0.5 to the right, then the noise level within the image can increase rapidly. The fill light is much more than a shadow lightener, since this also increases to the right, or decreases to the left, the microcontrast. This can lead to some very interesting artistic effects, which however can rapidly become overpowering, depending on the image, and usually a setting between minus 0.1 and plus 0.5 is a good start. It is of course possible to follow the changes within the histogram and even more precisely by the disappearance of the overexposure warnings. As a final check, moving the pointer over the image allows the RGB pixel values to be assessed. A few examples here from myself and Innis show how different fill light settings have had a different effect on an image. The possibility of recovering overexposed areas is however limited 
and thus the exposure in the camera is a bit of a tightrope walk. Here there is nothing better than one's own experience with a Sigma camera. And here another tip. At ISO 200 there is greater chance to recover more highlights than at ISO 100. It is also important to note that too much fill light can also result in unsightly halos around high contrast edges and this can look pretty ugly especially with a landscape image. Next up, white balance setting and colour mode. For most pictures, except for those taken under exceptional lighting conditions, daylight is a good start point for the white balance. Alternatives are shade, cloudy, incandescent, fluorescent, flash and original, which adopts the setting from the camera. The colour mode can be set initially to standard. With the settings neutral or vivid, all three colour channels are made more or less saturated to the same extent. Landscape and portrait are quite good settings for the appropriate motif. Here however particular colours are accentuated, green yellow for landscape and red for portrait, more than others, which is not always desired. The additional modes, such as Fovian Classic Blue for example, are of a more artistic nature and since they result in quite dramatic changes to the colour palette are not something I would normally use. Of course this is something that is very much personal taste. It should be noticed that the white balance, the colour mode and the colour adjustment settings have a subtle yet real interaction with each other so that any combined white balance and colour mode setting very much affects how the colour adjustment will work. I will leave this image first of all set with daylight which fits well for this subject. However, with the colour mode standard, the red tones of the flowers are too orange and actually the setting portrait gives a much better starting point. It is possible to use the colour adjustment in several different ways. With the pipette tool, here it can be activated or turned off, it is possible to click on an area in the image that one believes should be neutral. SPP then calculates what changes are necessary to the three colour channels in order to achieve this and applies the changes to the whole image. In the colour box the white point is then set at the correct position. The setting G and M for green and magenta respectively are self-explanatory. The AB setting rather less so. B does indeed stand for blue but the A is for orange with yellow and red being above and below the middle line respectively. A new position for the white dot can be set per click and drag or if this is the last tool that has been used by use of the keyboard arrows. Here I will select a relatively yellow area which means in order to neutralize it a considerable amount of blue needs to be added to the image. A final adjustment in the direction of magenta with the down arrow takes a little green out of the image. In the end I have a relatively neutral result. After these changes I go back to the exposure and fill light and check that these are still where I would like. Are the structures visible that I want to bring out in the image? The changes in the RGB values of the pixel as I move the pointer are a good indication that the fine structures and colours that I am looking for are present. After this the contrast and saturation are adjusted. This is done together since an increase in contrast automatically results in an increase in saturation and vice versa. If a channel becomes oversaturated then this will be marked with a blue warning area. Since I am starting from a relatively neutral position here I can increase the saturation somewhat which brings out many of the colour annoyances within the image. Since I have increased the saturation it is reasonable to assume that the chroma noise within the image has probably also been increased and so the chroma noise reduction slider is also moved slightly to the right. The other sliders within the tonal adjustment menu are used less often. Subtle adjustments to the light and dark areas of an image can be made with the shadow and highlight slider. The sharpness slider is something that I never adjust within SPP. In the first instance images from an X3F file are reasonably sharp anyway and, much more importantly, increasing the apparent sharpness within an image is probably one of the most destructive changes that can be applied to a digital image. As such, the sharpening is something that is done at the very end of the production of an image and then very specific to the reproduction method and then only to a copy of the data. But these are things which I do not do within SPP. 
As the processing is now complete, the changes to the RAW file should be saved and a TIFF file produced for further processing. Here at the top, the Save Image As menu is opened and the destination to save the file set. The adjustment mode allows the RAW settings to be saved under one of the three G menu points. As a reminder, saving the RAW adjustment settings here in SPP has no effect on the original RAW file. The image size, color space and file type are then set, which for me would be original size, Profoto RGB and TIFF 16-bit, and of course the file name. My file names are somewhat long and a little unusual I guess. The reason is that often many versions of a particular RAW file may be produced as a TIFF image and the particular RAW settings that lie behind the image can be interpreted very quickly from the file name. OK, click and the file begins to save. Again this also needs a little time. Now to close the window and check the TIFF file is present. Thank you and good luck with your Sigma camera and SPP.